But thank you so much for being here. We have such an amazing um, program today. We have two budding researchers, we call them, grad students at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, our first will be uh, pulling carbon out of thin air strategies from bacteria, algae, and plants from Julia Borden. And then after that, we will have from brain to behavior using advanced technologies to probe population activity in the brain um, with April Myers. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to our two speakers. Um, we're gonna start as we normally do with the land acknowledgement. Uh, Science at Cal recognizes that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and the other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering the land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you for allowing me the time to do that. Um, I'm going to start by just talking a little bit. If this is your first time at a Science at Cal event, welcome. Um, we're so happy to have you here. We bring the wonder and excitement of UC Berkeley STEM research to the community and all of our programs are free and geared towards public audiences. We hope to be in person at, in the fall, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we have events within the communities, uh, within our community, excuse me, at cafes, we are on campus, we are at festivals, Cal Day, Bay Area Science Festival, you name it, we partner with groups across the Bay Area. Um, and we do that by essentially talking with all of you and, and integrating ourselves within all the spaces where you are and all the programs that you are uh, committed to. So thank you for being here. I also wanna thank the people who support Science at Cal. So anyone who's helped us or given so generously. I know we had a, a few people, a bunch of people who donated today. And I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping continue all that we do at Science at Cal. We have some really fun programming for the rest of the summer before we go live. Um, we have our Midday Science Cafe where we partner with Berkeley Labs, two of those, one July, one August. We have our traditional Science at Cal lecture series. Um, the Science of happen Happiness is happening this month with the director, the science director of the Greater Good Science Center. Um, and we also have our last Grounds for Science um, in August before we head back in person. So check that out on August 12th. All right, we have are joined not just by all with all of you, but with some drinks today. We have two drinks that are themed uh, from the presentations you'll see, see today. Um, one is the Brainy Bellini, and one is the Mint Bojito. Um, one of our talks, as you know, will get into some brain science, and then the other one, some photosynthesis, how plants are important to uh, carbon removal. All right, we are going to start now with some trivia. Oh, we should mention because everyone always wants always ends up asking. Oh, we already got this question in the chat. So it's always a question everyone asks. One, this will be recorded and we will provide this talk for you uh, at the end of the event. You will get an email will also be on our Science at Cal YouTube channel. So go ahead and subscribe and follow our YouTube channel. Um, in addition, uh, you if you want closed captioning, you can go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click the closed captioning button and you should be able to see uh, captioning as they as as we speak. Um, and the last thing I think that was it. Those are the two things I wanted to tell you. Oh, no one more. There will be lots of time. If you've been to a Science of Cal event, you know that we like to engage with you. There will be time at the end of our program uh, to ask questions. At the end of each one of our speakers' presentations, you can talk to them directly. So you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions, or you can add your Q&A into the chat or into the Q&A box, and I will ask the questions for you. We love to get your questions. Please continue to uh, to ask those questions throughout the presentation. So I'm going to launch. I know you guys have been staring at this uh, true or false screen. Um, and if you can hear my dog playing with the dog toy, can you guys hear that? Um, yes, Julia is nodding. You can hear my dog playing with his dog toy. Okay. 
So I'm going to go ahead and, and start our polling with our first question. True or false? Uh, Julie is going to help us answer this one. Global human made mass exceeds all living biomass. And I wrote down some human made masses, metals, asphalt, concrete, plastics, brick, gravel. These are all the things that Julie is asking in this question. And living biomass, this is essentially all organic matter, right, Julia? Um, so true. you can expand on that if you want to. Yeah, everything on the slide here, for example, plants, oh, yeah. animals, fungi, bacteria, archaea, viruses, protists. Nice. All right, so we have 70% to, so I'm going to end the, I, can we get up to 75? We got up to 75. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Let's see what the, what everyone thinks it is. Share results. False. We got a uh, false coming in. Julia. Um, so the answer as of last year is now true and getting ever more true. Um, so I actually, the title of this slide is literally the title of um, the paper that did this modeling, which is um, just the statement that human global human made mass does exceed all living biomass at this point. So this was a modeling paper, meaning they took um, what we know of uh, the mass that humans have created um, since the start of 1900, which is shown in this graph. So concrete, um, aggregates, gravel, bricks, asphalt, metals, plastics, all of that. Um, and they uh, did some calculations to see how much of that have we created over time as humans. And given what we know of all uh, doing some estimations of the mass of all living biomass on our planet, what is uh, the break-even point? And we can see that this happened last year. So um, just another uh, reason why 2020 was not a great year, which that's uh, more or less the break-even point for when human-made mass exceeds all uh, living biomass. Yeah, I think, okay, just barely, but we'll never go below that line anymore, right? It's gonna be hard to go yeah. below it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will go ahead and launch our second poll. Let's go to poll two, launch. Okay. Question is, plants breathe the same way we do, inhaling oxygen and exhaling CO2. All right, almost up to 75. Let's see if we can do it, guys. What do we think? My dog really wants to participate here. All right, ending the poll and sharing the results. False. Julia, what do you think while I go on mute? Um, so congrats to the eight people who voted true. Um, it was a little bit of a trick question um, because plants can breathe in two different ways. Um, so plants can in fact breathe the same way that we do when they inhale oxygen and exhale CO2. Um, this isn't what we primarily learn about photosynthesis. Well, we primarily learn about photosynthesis, which is the opposite, meaning um, plants can intake CO2 and sunlight and water and produce their own food in the form of sugar. So that primarily happens in the daytime as shown on the left. Um, but then at night, plants break down that sugar into energy for growth, um, and they actually uh, breathe the same way we do, which is called respiration. So they intake CO2 and then um, exhale, or intake oxygen and exhale CO2. Um, so a little fun fact about plants. Love Dude, it. Here, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to avoid having my dog squeaky toy in the background. All right. So let's move on to question number three. Our last question. I'm going to launch this poll. True or false? Photosynthesis first evolved in plants. Let's see what folks have to say there. 
see. Is he being quiet? Yes. <laughs> the dog is now in his dog bed. <laughs> see if he stays there. <laughs> All right, where are we? We're at 70. Can we get to 75 again? You guys aren't, you guys are this one? You know, Julia, we, you've been um, accused of trick, trick questions. <laughs> I don't think they're good questions though. I think they're good questions. <laughs> I want people to learn something, you know? Yeah. All right. I'm going to end the poll at 70 because maybe it's a, maybe this one's harder for folks. Share results. All right, we have false, and the answer is false. Yeah, congrats to the uh, majority of folks who voted false. Um, photosynthesis did not first evolve in plants. It first evolved in bacteria about 3 billion years before it came to plants. So um, we have uh, bacteria to thank for this amazing process. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. You guys did an excellent job. I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand things over to Julia while I go ahead and, oh, somebody's, can we all um, unmute ourselves if you are unmute, or excuse me, mute yourself. Um, I can't tell who's muted, but here we go, Julia is a PhD candidate in the molecular and cellular biology department at UC Berkeley. Julia has long been motivated by our urgent need to address accelerating climate change and the potential for biology to provide solutions. In this vein, her PhD work studies how bacteria concentrates and metabolize carbon dioxide. Prior to Berkeley, she worked at, at a synthetic biology companies, excuse me, at synthetic biology companies, Modern Meadow and Ginkgo Bioworks Engineering microbes to produce a variety of products. Very cool. Outside of the lab, Julia loves learning languages, running and exploring the California coast. Very cool, Julia. I will hand things over to you. Thanks, D. Um, I just want to check you can see my screen and Yep, we can. Good. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Julia Borden. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at UC Berkeley. And today I am going to talk to you about uh, strategies from cyanobacteria, algae, and plants and how they pull carbon out of thin air. A key problem facing our society and future societies is how to capture CO2 or carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, meaning it absorbs and traps heat. Ever since the industrial revolution, humans have been releasing more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. And this is a primary cause of global climate warming. It may sound obvious, but capturing and removing CO2 provides a solution to lower these CO2 levels in our atmosphere. This problem is so immense that even the top business leaders in America are interested in figuring out how to capture CO2. Elon Musk in January tweeted, I'm donating 100 million towards a prize for best carbon capture technology, to which UC Berkeley professor Mike Eisen uh, who's a professor in the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology, tweeted back, cool, Elon Musk is giving $100 million to photosynthesis. Well, photosynthesis is in fact nature's best carbon capture technology. All it takes is sunlight, CO2, and water to produce growth of the organism, the plant as shown in this picture, and release of oxygen. I do wanna highlight that all of the growth that's occurring, the accumulation of biomass does directly come from carbon dioxide, the, those single carbons that the plant then links together um, to build itself. So what percent of the atmosphere is CO2? And I wanna take a second for folks to think of a number in their head.
So uh, usually people guess around um, five to 10%, and it turns out that the answer is 0.04%. Uh, it's so small that there's actually no slice uh, visible on this graph. So what does it look like to capture something with an abundance of 0.04%? Well, uh, I'll walk you through it with an analogy. So this is me in a field and let's say I'm, uh, I, I wanna capture some butterflies and I especially wanna capture blue morpho butterflies and not the brown moths. Um, so if the blue butterflies are at an abundance of 0.04%, what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Uh, it's clearly very, uh, very low abundance and I'm going to be uh, uh, taking a long time to try to capture that one blue butterfly. So how do I capture it? How can I um, make this process more efficient? If I somehow funnel blue butterflies into one room and stick with me, this, this does relate, it would be easier to capture only blues. And this might seem um, rather obvious, like, yes, ob it, of course, if I put all the blue butterflies in one room, it's gonna be easy to capture them. And you might be wondering why I'm talking about this, um, but it'll make sense in just a second. Many photosynthetic organisms concentrate CO2, similarly to how I propose concentrating that, those blue butterflies in order to capture it efficiently. And I'm gonna walk us through how cyanobacteria, algae, and plants do this specific uh, mechanism of concentrating CO2. So first of all, let's look at cyanobacteria. What are cyanobacteria? Uh, you might know them as kind of the green scum that you see in lakes, though cyanobacteria are found in water all over the world in um, oceans, in fresh water, even in soil. And if you look at them under a microscope, they would look rather like what you see on the right, kind of like green rods. And how do cyanobacteria capture CO2? They use a specialized room inside their cells called carboxysomes. So here I've drawn a picture of a single uh, bacterium. And uh, if you look inside, you'll see these um, polyhedra, here they're just drawn in 2D, so they're hexagons, but they're these polyhedral bodies um, that are really rooms inside of the cell where CO2 gets concentrated, similar to those blue butterflies. Um, looking at some actual pictures and not just a cartoon, if I stain the cells and look at these carboxysomes shown in green, you can see these uh, green dots throughout the cell, lining the entire body of the cell. In another microscope image uh, shown on the right, you can see these dark, uh, again, hexagonal shapes, and those are the, the carboxysomes, and then shown um, even, uh, concentrated even more on the right in figure B. And uh, just as a side note, I study how carboxysomes function in my PhD. So moving on, next is algae. What are algae? Algae are very diverse um, and they're more complicated uh, in their cell structure than cyanobacteria, going all the way from single cells all the way up to giant kelps. Um, they're found in the ocean, they're found in fresh water, and you can even see them from space. So how do algae capture CO2? They use a specialized uh, cellular compartment, same as a uh, similar in idea to those rooms in cyanobacteria, but this one is called the pyrenoid. Um, so here I'm showing you an example of two different types of algae. Um, one is called chlamydomonas, and you can see this circular structure um, found in the middle of its body and here in cartoon form, which is the pyrenoid. And then a second species called euglena, where it also has these circular structures that I've highlighted throughout its cell body. And 
uh, though this structure is different from the carboxysome in cyanobacteria, it's the exact same idea of creating a specialized room in the cell, a specialized compartment where all of that CO2 can be concentrated so it can be effectively captured. Lastly, what are plants in terms of their carbon capture categories? So there are actually three categories of plants um, when we think about how plants capture CO2. Um, the first is called C3. They're, they do not have a specialized way of capturing CO2 um, and they're therefore less efficient at capturing CO2. The second category is called C4. These plants have a special cell type um, to capture CO2. Um, and we'll be talking for, uh, about this particular category and this special cell type makes it much more efficient at capturing CO2. The third category is called CAM um, and the way that they capture CO2 more efficiently is uh, to only capture CO2 at night. So they have this day night separation that the other two categories don't have. And these are your typical um, succulents and cacti. And today I'll be talking specifically about these C4 plants and why they're so important and so interesting for carbon capture. So some examples of C4 plants that you're probably all familiar with include maize or corn, sugarcane, and papyrus, and there are many, many more. So how do C4 plants concentrate CO2? They use specialized cells. And this is the same idea as the, with the algae and the cyanobacteria, where you have a special compartment within the organism. So here I, I have a cutout of, um, or a drawing of a cutout of leaf tissue, and each um, kind of circular uh, blob is a cell. So you can see deep within the leaf tissue, there's this circle of pink cells, and those specific cells are where the CO2 gets concentrated. So again, we have a room within the body of the plant where the CO2 resides. Um, and then looking at actual pictures of plants, here I have cutouts of uh, leaf tissue from rice, which is in the category of not being able to uh, concentrate CO2 very efficiently, and cetaria, which falls into this C4 category. And you can see in the rice that the dark green is really all throughout the leaf tissue. Um, whereas in Ceteria, that really dark green color is only in this central um, circle within the leaf tissue. So because Ceteria has uh, that dark green color indicating the area where CO2 is being captured, because it's in this specific part of the cell, that allows it to be much more efficient at capturing CO2 because it concentrates the CO2 in one location. We need to study these mechanisms more uh, to be able to design more CO2 efficient plants. So the one goal is as the world population increases and we have more and more mouths to feed, we need to be able to come up with ways to make plants more efficient and especially more efficient at grabbing CO2 out of the air. So one way we can do that is to study the mechanisms I've been talking about. One project that's currently ongoing with a consortium of scientists from around the world is called the C4 Rice Project. Um, in this uh, project, they're taking rice, which is a very important food crop, but does not have um, a CO2 concentrating mechanism. And they're trying to uh, design rice to have that room in its cell tissue, that those compartmentalized cells in its tissue to make it more efficient at CO2 capture. And if you're interested, you can visit the website uh, for this C4 rice project. Um, and other, uh, a couple other of projects that are ongoing from labs around the world are the same idea, but using the concepts that we've learned about from cyanobacteria and algae. So on the left uh, is a figure showing how one can conceptually think about taking 
um, the carboxysome, that room that concentrates CO2 and cyanobacteria, and putting it in a plant leaf. So here we see a golden uh, uh, polyhedral structure put inside a plant leaf, and we start with some small plants, but once we have carboxysomes and maybe a few other cellular components, we could have plants capture much more CO2 than they did before and grow larger. Uh, produce more biomass. The same idea is currently being studied and evaluated uh, for the algal pyrenoid. Um, so here uh, we have a picture of chlamydomonas, that's that algae that I showed a picture of, and this green circle is the pyrenoid, that room structure inside the algae. So we can take that uh, pyrenoid and put it into, again, a leaf cell and uh, with a few other components that uh, those plants could potentially grow 60% bigger. So the key problem facing us, again, is how to capture CO2 in our atmosphere. And I do want to point out that there are other types of uh, air of capture technology, specifically mechanical direct air capture technology that do exist. But here, I show you this picture specifically because you'll notice that it's an array of giant fans. And the reason they have these large fans is because they need to pull in the air because CO2 is such a, a small component of our atmosphere, 0.04%, that they really need to draw air in for this air capture technology uh, to be efficient. And the scale of this is immense. You'll see this, uh, the tiny human and car on the lower right of this photo. Um, so these structures are huge. But as we learn more about biological carbon capture and how to engineer plants to capture more carbon, um, this could be a potentially uh, huge way to take even more CO2 out of our atmosphere. And with that, I would like to uh, say thank you uh, to Dr. Dion Rossiter um, for putting this together and assisting us um, with the slides, uh, at, or having us practice, do practice runs, and uh, Rosalind Sarvi uh, hey. for, thank you for very much. Helping. Thank you, Julia. So sweet of you to thank us. <laughs> that has happened often during these talks, so I appreciate it. We have some really good questions coming in. So two folks actually asked specifically about essentially how, how does the CO2 get in the room? Um, and if you want to talk about um, carboxysomes capturing the CO2, because that's what you study specifically, somebody was asking about that. So could you talk a little bit more about how the CO2 actually gets in the room? Yes. So. Um, the CO2 is uh, membrane permeable, meaning that all cells have um, membranes around them, and CO2 can actually just easily pass through. Um, so it might sound like that's a good thing, but it's actually a problem because if CO2 can go in, it can also go out. Um, so one way that a lot of these organisms um, even further concentrate CO2 is by turning it into a molecule uh, that cannot pass through, which happens to be um, bicarbonate, which has the, um, its chemical structure is HCO3 um, and it has a negative charge. So it has an extra hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and by, turn, by adding in hydrogen and oxygen onto the CO2 and giving it a negative charge, then the cells can keep the CO2 um, within the cell and then turn it back into that CO2 to go into the room. <laughs> Very cool and sounds complicated. So <laughs> do, do, does each room work a little differently or sort of similarly? You know, in the different, um, they, the different they all different. Uh, function relatively at their core, they function in the exact same way, mm -hmm. but there are details in their architecture uh, mm -hmm. that make them different. So it might be like how a room is a room, right? Mm -hmm. But a room in a museum is different from your bedroom, <laughs> I guess is a way you could talk about it. But yeah. all of the chemistry that happens is exactly the same. Um, but they look a little different. 
that, that's perfectly in line with the next question before we hand things over to April was how did these special compartments or rooms, um, how did those structures even evolve if they're a little different in all these different places? Yeah, um, so they evolved uh, starting in bacteria. The carboxysomes were the very first rooms to evolve. Um, and they evolved in response to what's called the great oxygenation event. Um, so about two uh, billion years ago, what happened is after photosynthesis evolved, um, photosynthetic organisms started uh, pumping a lot of oxygen into the atmosphere. And so it wasn't necessary to have a room um, before there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere because CO2 was already at a high concentration um, all around us in the air. We don't need to concentrate it in a room if it's already at a high concentration everywhere. Um, so that once CO2 levels went down and oxygen levels went up, then that's when the need to evolve these rooms became necessary for all um, for most photosynthetic life on earth. All right, well, thank you so much, Julia. We will have more time to ask her questions um, at the end of the program. I'm going to go back and share my screen here. I hope you can see that now because I'm going to invite April up to do another set of trivia questions before we hop in with her. So can you guys all see that? Yeah. Good, awesome. So I'm gonna start with our first polling question. Um, and I wanna apologize actually, cause I didn't before that these slides are a little bit blurry um, and sorry for that. We were copying and pasting their slides onto my home set slides. And for whatever reason, they turned up blurry this time, but you are a forgiving crowd, I'm sure. So let's find out the answer to these questions. Um, the brain consumes blank percent of your body's energy. Let's see, for 1.4 to 20, 35. There you are, April. I was like, you weren't showing up on the front of my screen. <laughs> All right, we're at 80. Oh, 85. You guys are really guessing. I was like, oh, should we wait another second? No, I'm going to end it here. Let's see what happens. All right, I'm going to share the results. The majority of the people, let's see, 20%. That's good. <laughs> oh, want to say anything about that, April? Yeah, sure. Um, so you guys did good with that. Yeah, the brain consumes 20% of the total amount of energy that goes into your body, which is really, really high in proportion to your uh, brain's weight in comparison to your body. It's only about 2.2% or three pounds. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about a why, why uh, how, the, how signals in the brain travel electronically and why uh, this is such an energy intensive process. Awesome, thank you. So our next question, what percentage of your brain is active at any given time? So I will go ahead and launch that second poll. There we go. We have 1%, 10%, 70% or 100%. And April is, has, is clever here and has asked a bonus question. Maybe have in your head what you think about when you're sleeping. So what percentage of your brain is active at any given time? Let's see, 55% of the votes. Last time we had a record high of 85%. <laughs> you guys are doing great and you got the right answer. So let's see, I think there's a tie between what you all think. So we should get, we should get out of that tie here. Oh, now it's really tight. All right, I'm gonna stop it here because it's kind of cool. All right, so let's find out, share results. We had 10% and 100% at 37% of you guys. And the answer, April. Okay, so yeah, it's interesting. You guys are completely split here because the answer is 100%, but it's an extremely common misconception that you only use 10% of your brain, either at a time or in general or whatever. Um, and this is completely untrue. I don't know if you guys remember the science fiction movie from maybe 10 years ago where the whole premise was that you only use 10% of your brain and what if we could use more? Um, 
but that's not true. You use all of your brain pretty much all the time, even when you're asleep. Good to know. All right. At what age do you have the most connections between neurons, AKA brain cells? Let it think about that for a second while I launch this poll. At birth, two to three years of age, 13 to 15 years of age, and 22 to 25 years of age. Yeah, I'm an earth scientist. Speaking of earthquakes and that and, and movies that are always like ridiculously wrong, there are a lot of like earth science movies that are just hilarious. So I'm sure you share the same frustration, um, April, when that movie came out. Like, that's not even true. All right, where are we? We're at 77%. Let's try to get up to 80, folks. Few of you. Let's see if you can. Five. Four. Come on. Okay, and full. Oh, we got to 81%. Good job, guys. Okay, we have 22 to 25% year, or excuse me, years of age. The answer, April. Okay. Um, yeah, so the answer is two to three years of age. Um, and I put a red herring in here because people often say your cognition starts to decline at like 25, which actually isn't really true either. But um, and it sounds scary that the connections between your brain cells peak at such a young age, but um, there's actually this really important uh, called synaptic pruning process where you, you peak in your number of brain connections at this young age. And then as you learn more about the world um, and you know, gain brain function, certain pathways that aren't important get kind of pruned away and ones that are important stay there. Um, so it's actually really important to your brain function that these connections are reduced when you age. I'm muted again. That was excellent, you guys. Thank you so much for that. Good job. I am going to stop share and I'm going to hand things over to April as I read her bio for you all. April grew up on a farm in rural Missouri where she gained a love for the natural world and became curious about sensory biology. April received her BA in neurobiology from the college, from the new college of Florida in Sarasota, Florida, where she conducted research as an undergraduate exploring the effects of repeated mild traumatic brain injury on degenerative and inflammatory activity in the mouse optic nerve. That was a mouthful. In 2018, April chose to continue her work in visual neuroscience by joining the vision science graduate group at UC Berkeley. Here, she spent her first year of graduate education investigating different subtypes of cells in the mouse retina and how they interact to create a visual per, uh, percept. April is currently in the lab of Najee, where she uses advanced imaging and animal behavioral techniques to investigate properties of cells in the visual cortex. Um, she plans on pursuing a career in biotechnology development in order to take cutting edge technologies and neuroscience available to improve the lives of patients. Thank you so much for being here, April. Take it away, your screen looks great. Great. Um, so as Dion said, my name is April Myers and I am a graduate student in the Vision Science Graduate Group at UC Berkeley. And my talk today is called From Brain to Behavior, Using Advanced Technologies to Probe Population Activity in the Brain. So just to start off very basic, as I'm sure you know, the brain is this wrinkly organ in your head. Um, it has many functions related to generating your internal experience of the world, including your thoughts, memories, and emotions. And it also does a lot of important things related to how we interact with the world, such as allowing us to perceive the world through our senses and control our bodies. So how does the brain work exactly? Um, so it's made up of billions of cells called neurons. There are uh, roughly 100 billion neurons in the average adult brain, which is about equivalent to the number of stars in the galaxy. Not all of these neurons are the same. They come in all, come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and uh, different types of molecular characteristics. There's just uh, the illustration on the right is just a small sampling. 
And all of these different neurons communicate with each other through electrical impulses. And that's what the cell on the left is doing as it's flashing, it's sending uh, impulses to other cells. And one of these neurons can connect with thousands or even millions of other neurons in this way. So this is a very uh, large, complicated system. And as you can imagine, studying this type of system presents several challenges to researchers. One is that it just requires a lot of detailed information and space and time to track the activity of many neurons as, at once, which is what is required to ask complicated questions about some of the really complicated things the brain does, like uh, guiding our behavior and generating our thoughts and emotions and things like that. Um, these interactions happen really quickly and we need to track the timing of these neuron-to-neuron -neuron interactions very precisely to understand how they work. Another challenge is that neurons are very small. At its widest point, the average neuron is about 1 50th the, the width of a human hair. And then the points of connection in between neurons are much smaller than that. Another challenge is that the brain is made of this really fatty, dense tissue that makes it difficult to physically access parts of the brain that are more on the inside and not as close to the surface. And also, obviously, the brain is enclosed in this sturdy layer of bone called the skull that, again, just makes it physically difficult to access. So how do, science, how do, how do scientists go about addressing these challenges and getting an amount of information about the brain can that, that can really inform us about uh, these complicated processes that the brain does. Um, scientists have begin, begun using genetic tools to tag specific neurons in the brain with fluorescent molecules based on their genetic identity. This makes the neurons um, emit light when we shine a certain kind of light on them. And then using advanced microscope technology, we can collect the light emitted by these neurons and use them to generate a video like the one I'm showing you on the right, where we can actually see neurons talking to each other in real time. So the video I'm showing you now is very similar to what I just showed you. But by bending the light in a certain way in a method comparable to how a scanner reads a barcode in the store, we can greatly increase the number of neurons that we um, can look at at once by looking at different uh, planes of neurons. So these are six different fields of view of neurons that we can look at at once. And this pushes up the number of neurons we can take recordings from at once to about 10,000. Of course, when you consider that there are billions and billions of neurons, even in, the, in a mouse's brain, uh, this is just a very small fraction of the number of neurons that are present. Um, however, recordings such as these provide a strong basis to start to understand how large groups of cells um, work together to respond to the environment. Here's another example of the types of things we can do with this technology, this time uh, from our collaborators at Caltech. This is an entire brain of a fruit fly responding to three different odors for the three different panels that you see. Um, and the flashing in the video is essentially the moment that in which the odor is being received by the fly. So you can really see the fly smelling in real time. So those were just some examples of the things we can do with this technology. Now I'm going to give you um, a specific example of a type of technology that neuroscientists have actually adapted this used to look at distance objects in space. So um, especially if you live here in the Bay, um, you've probably noticed if you look at an object far in the distance, such as the Golden Gate Bridge from across the Bay or something like that, you can see uh, fog kind of obscuring your view of that object. And the reason this occurs is due to a phenomenon called atmospheric blur. And this is basically when you look at particles in between you and that object, basically obscure your vision and create this fuzzy or uh, blurry effect. Um, this is a big problem when astronomers are looking at very distant objects in space through a telescope. A technology has been uh, developed to deal with this problem called adaptive optics. And um, this essentially allows researchers to determine how particles in the atmosphere 
are blurring the image through the telescope. And then this allows um, the image to be sharpened essentially based on this information, um, greatly increasing the image quality of things that can be seen through a telescope and also increasing the distance in which we can see objects in space. You may remember seeing this technology in the news recently when the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics was announced. Um, if you remember seeing this image, adaptive optics was used to uh, directly visualize a black hole at the center of our galaxy for the first time using this advanced imaging technology. So the neuroscientists that I have worked with have begun using this adaptive optics approach to correct for the blur induced by dense fatty brain tissue when we try to look at it through a microscope. And we found that this greatly increases the depth at which we can look at neurons in the brain and also how well we can see um, small structures that are found there deep in the brain. So now um, the special thing about this technology really is that it allows us to see such small structures deep in the brain with such a high level of detail that we can make out not just only the large body of the cell as I was showing you in videos previously, but now we can also see the tiny uh, points of connection in between neurons. And this is really important for um, actually understanding how signals are passed between neurons and how neurons are able to work together to guide our behavior and do these really complex tasks. So now I'm gonna bring up a related uh, but slightly different technology called optogenetics. So if you remember how I described that we're able to uh, engineer neurons to emit light when we shine a special light at them, and then we use that light emitted by the cells to make images on a microscope. Um, some scientists took the same idea a little bit further and said, instead of just engineering to make cells glow in response to engineering cells to make them glow in response to light, we are actually going to engineer cells to become active in response to light. So this takes us from uh, just observing the cell's behavior to actually controlling their behavior. So as you can see in this video I'm showing you on the left, the mouse is wandering around, exploring its environment until a pulse of light is delivered to its brain via the cable you see there. And uh, then the mouse. Oh, looks like we lost her. She'll probably hop back on in a second. Why don't we take some questions from Julia then? Do you wanna do that, Julia? Sure. Okay, cool. I was telling everyone, um, I was telling Julia and April that you all are a forgiving bunch. So <laughs> if that happened, um, that we would just take questions. Does anyone want to ask Julia a question from the audience? We can go, I can go ahead and um, uh, mute you. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you do. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see the reactions button. Ivan, go for it. Uh, thank you, Diana. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question for Julia is, um, if we're building an understanding of how the living organisms capture the CO2, is there any considerations for preventing re-emission of the CO2 after um, the uh, living organisms decay? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Cause you're right that as organisms die and decay, then uh, they release uh, their, all their matter back uh, into the soil or into the atmosphere. Um, I, I'd say the primary um, desire of scientists and engineers who are designing uh, plants to capture CO2 at higher efficiency is to grow bigger plants um, that then we can use to feed um, ourselves and animals. Um, so I guess the, the thought is that not so much decay, um, you know, in the ground will be happening, it, that rather we would take those plants um, and the greater biomass that they have, the more you know, fruits and vegetables that they provide, um, and then use that to be a food source. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Great. 
Um, what is the most important plant to grow to capture CO2? Is it a tree or is it maybe something else? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, I would say that anything in the C4 category that I talked about, so those plants that capture CO2 much more efficiently, um, that, that would be, you know, those would be the top candidates. Um, so actually corn is in that category. Um, but obviously there are a lot of things to consider in this uh, question, such as how long does the plant live? And you mentioned trees and, and trees can live a very long time. So they're uh, storing that CO2 for a longer period of time. So uh, I guess it depends on what the final outcome is. Is it food? Is it storage? Um, if you're talking about overall efficiency, um, then you might not even consider plants. Though in your question, you specified plants, but um, the most efficient organisms at capturing CO2 would actually be cyanobacteria. Before we hand things back over to April, um, are, are trees C4 or C3 or a mix? Um, I think they're primarily C3, though I would have to look up that question to make sure mm -hmm. um, there might be some in the C4 category. Good question then. I like questions that a little bit stump the, <laughs> the Yeah, answers. that's a good one. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, but um, mostly C3. Hey, April, want to go ahead and try to share your screen one more time? That was like, all of a sudden you were just gone. So we just started in with questions for Julia, but I think you should take it away because you had some, I hope she's not frozen again, because you were just about to get into some interesting stuff. Oh no. Maybe she's her, in the waiting room. Oh, now she's says? back in the waiting. Okay. She was there and then she was gone. Okay. April, you with us? Hey, I'm so sorry about that. I am having uh, computer yeah. problems apparently. No worries. We just had Julie answer some questions. Um, so why don't you go ahead and share your screen where you were and hopefully we can at least finish up with um, the presentation without it happening again, I'd hope. Um, sure. We'll try. Um, mm -hmm. So I actually didn't realize that I cut out when I did. So I'm not sure. Uh, wh at what point did I drop? Oh, great. So you were um, showing the video of the light with the mouse um, and then about to explain kind of the behavior change. I think that's where you were. Would you say that's where she was, Julia? Yes, I see some Henry. Henry's nodding his head. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, it says post disabled. Oh, just right. Disabled. Because you are now, I have to re co host you. So there you go. You should have access to do that. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it was the movie. And you had right. your voice had been kind of cutting out, but now your voice seems um, clear again. So we should be good to go. And I hope it's okay, okay with uh, both you and a uh, you and Julie if we go over a bit. Um, again, our our crowd is um, usually forgiving of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess I'll just start over at the beginning of the slide and mm -hmm. hope uh, I don't cut out again. So um, yeah, I was just explaining that. Uh, this optogenetics technology is being used to basically engineer neurons to become active in response to light. So as you can see in this video, um, when the, the mouse is just exploring this environment and then when a pulse of light is sent through the cable connected to its brain, um, it starts this licking behavior because the neurons that uh, control the licking behavior are being activated by the light because they've been engineered to do that through uh, this optogenetic technology. So um, I hope that you can appreciate that this type of ability to control specific populations of neurons in the brain could have huge implications for treating neurodegenerative disorders, uh, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and as well as mental illnesses, uh, such as depression and ADHD. And we are really just at the very beginning of seeing this used in a clinical setting. Earlier this year, actually, in a study involving researchers at the School of Optometry here at Berkeley, um, clinical trials began for an optogenetic treatment for blindness. Um, the idea is 
basically, if we can engineer cells in the mouse's brain to respond to light, uh, we can use that same technology to engineer uh, neurons in the eyes of patients with blindness to be responsive to light. And what's going on in many of these patients is, um, you know, they have uh, some gene genetic or degenerative factor that makes the typical mechanism by which their eye responds to light not work. And this optogenetic approach could basically engineer them to have an alternative pathway by which their eyes respond to light. So the powerful thing about this approach is, is that it can really help people who previously did not have a lot of treatment options available to them and it can be used to address a wide uh, range of conditions. So uh, this is my last slide. These are just some videos to send us off. Um, and I hope this has convinced you that the advanced neuroscience technology that I've talked about really have the potential to improve the lives of many people. And uh, this is something we should be really excited about. And I just wanted to thank obviously you for listening as well as the Grounds for Science team for helping me prepare this presentation and everyone in my lab. So thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much, April. So let's head into some of these questions. Um, so those those um, images, are those structures illuminated by light or are they fluorescing? Those are, um, uh, sorry, which images are you talking about? Um, where oh, those green? are uh, fluorescing. So these are illuminated by a specific wavelength of light that we're shooting at them and then in response Oh no. Oh, we had her, you guys. We had her so good. <laughs> All right, she might do the thing where she hops off and then hops back on. That's too bad. We have not, oh, there we go. April, you're back. All right, so you shine a, a specific light and then they are illuminated is what you had just finished saying. Yeah, so the answer is fluorescence. Fluorescence, yeah. Right. Um, why do you use the fly brain as opposed to, to study the human brain in this scenario? Yeah, so that's a question that comes up a lot. Um, basically, the answer is there are a lot of um, basic questions about neuroscience, such as, you know, how is visual information processed or um, olfactory information about scent, um, as we saw in the video. There's a lot of to be gained in terms of information about those kind of basic processes or just basic information about how neurons function um, that can be gained by looking, say, at the fly. That can't be used to address certain higher level questions that are more uh, obviously clinically relevant, maybe. You know, for example, it's hard to ask a uh, fly if it has ADHD or something. So it, that might not be an appropriate research question, but there are. Um, certain questions where uh, these animal models really open up a lot of doors for us to explore uh, questions that are just not possible to explore in humans at this point. Excellent, thank you. So I'll sort of have folks, if you guys wanna ask either April or Julia a question, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep going back and forth with them with the questions that you've asked in the chat. But again, feel free to click the uh, reactions button and click the raise hand. And then you can, once uh, I have, you've gotten my attention, I will go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. So it looks like I'm just gonna keep asking questions from the chat. Um, this is a good one. April, how do, you, how do you foresee brain imaging technologies developing within the next 100 years? look into the future, a little bit of your career out there, right? Yeah, I mean, that is a really good question because I'm thinking a hundred years ago was just around the time uh, we discovered neurons were this uh, important unit to processing in general. So clearly we've come a long way since then, uh, but there's still these massive unanswered questions. So, uh, a large point I was making in this presentation is that it's not enough to know about uh, what a single neuron is doing or even what a group of neurons is doing to answer these really complicated questions about how the brain works and how uh, behavior works and, and sensory perception and stuff like that. We really need to 
monitor activity in a large number of cells in a large area of the brain or areas multiple of the brain at once. Um, and I think, you know, we need imaging technology and data storage technology and microscopy technology to just push that forward. And I think as strides continue to be made in that, um, we will see a lot of progress with being able to, um, like I talked about the end of my presentation, actually control behavior in the brain um, and things like that. And that will tell us a lot about how the brain works. Excellent, thank you. Nan, do you want to unmute yourself? Feel free. Uh, yeah, I had a question for April. That was, um, how does this work of engineering the behavior of neurons um, dovetail with mental illness issues? Yeah, sure. Um, so for example, in that video I showed you, um, scientists, you know, this is based on, de on decades of research um, that where scientists have been able to identify the set of neurons that is important for the drinking behavior and then activate that set of neurons to uh, make the mouse drink water. And strides have been made, for example, in uh, seeing that it, oftentimes in people with severe depression, for example, a group of neurons uh, is chronically underactive. And if we can identify what that group of neurons is, um, and we can activate those specific cells that can perhaps treat the condition. And that was just an obvious example, but there are many examples um, where we can identify that a specific population of cells is relevant to a clinical condition and then specifically target that population of cells. Great question. Um, Julia, next question for you. Um, why did, this is a good question too. I always like the ones that make me scratch my head too. Why did some plants evolve the ability to concentrate CO2 more effectively and efficiently than others? Wouldn't this benefit all of the um, organisms that photosynthesize? Why only some? Yeah, so it is true that um, a large uh, variety of plants do not use this specialized cell structure to concentrate CO2. Um, and rather what they do is um, they just, so by doing, by having specialized compartments or cells to concentrate CO2, um, the advantage is efficiency um, above all else. So both uh, the plants with the structures and without can live just fine, but the ones with the special cell structures are more efficient at capturing CO2. Um, so the so what happens is that in the plants that uh, don't have these special cell structures, they just have to produce a lot more of the machinery in their cells to process the CO2 than the ones that have the special cell structures. So it's kind of an economic question of economics of the plant. Um, and it, it just so happens that because both work well, they've both um, evolved and flourished in the plant world. Um, but in terms of kind of economics of resources and energy, um, that's why having the rooms are, is more efficient. Great, thank you, Julia. Joshua, do you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself? Yes, I have a quick question as far as this is for um, concerning the plants. Mm -hmm. And my question would be, why does plants have mitochondria also? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so to for folks who don't know what mitochondria are, uh, mitochondria are, plants have a lot of special structures um, in their cells. And this is another type of special um, structure I, or room, if you will, uh, since I've been using the word rooms. Um, so because plants um, do the same type of chemistry that we do, where they um, can take in oxygen um, in order to break down sugar. So photosynthesis is um, the reverse of that, where they're making their own sugars from sunlight, CO2, and water. Um, but then the plants actually do break down the sugar um, and use it for, uh, for energy, to produce cellular energy. So they do that in mitochondria the same way that we do. So does, sorry, so that means that the mitochondria is mostly working at night, is that correct? So yes. Okay, thank you. 
Another really great question. Um, thank you. All right, April. Um, you know, we're hearing about brain stimulation devices in the news lately, right? And so someone wants to know, how do these relate to what you're talking about specifically? Yeah, um, so some of you may have heard in the news, there's a deep brain stimulation device um, that's in clinical trials right now for Parkinson's disease or um, Neuralink and stuff like that. There are kind of um, electrode-based devices that are physically surgically implanted in your brain and control the activity of certain cells. Um, and these, th these technologies are great and have a lot of potential, um, as well as some limitations that need to be worked out still. Um, but one of those limitations is that uh, our ability to use these devices to help people clinically is limited by our ability to target cells with this stimulation and know which cells to target. And the kind of imaging technology that I was talking about is really relevant to knowing uh, what cells to target in those cases. Um, so that imaging technology will need to come together with this brain stimulation technology to make these devices um, really, really useful. So we sort of have half the pie right now and not the other half essentially. Yeah. Yeah, more work needs to be done, but I'd say that's something that's really promising on the horizon. Yeah. So somebody was asking about this flashing light to be used to control prosthesis. Have you heard of anything like that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that actually is interesting. Uh, uh, some of the uh, um, a goal of one of these devices I was just talking about is to control prosthetics because for a few reasons, that's kind of a simpler um, issue to work on as opposed to uh, more complicated issues like neurodegenerative disease that involve large areas of the brain and stuff. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, involving prostheses often involves just targeting a certain number of cells in a very specific area as opposed to this wide array of cells that um, is located across a large physical space. Um, so yeah, to respond to that, uh, question there yeah this light pulsing idea to activate the cells could absolutely be used for those uh types of applications excellent thank you and julia you know we had a few people who in the chat who wanted to talk about essentially capturing co2 in the oceans as opposed to using air because you were talking about how do we do this effectively and using the fans to capture to uh, have more airflow um, to possibly capture more more CO2. So essentially, um, lots of CO2 is stored in the ocean, correct? And through um, bio, bio, bicarbonates and then other people are asking, yeah, essentially that question about, are people thinking about how we do this in the oceans more effectively as well? Yeah, and that's a really great question um, because the ocean does have so many photosynthetic organisms and also, like you said, um, has a large pool of CO2. Um, so carbon, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is primarily in the form of carbon dioxide, CO2, um, but in our oceans, it's primarily um, in other forms. So I mentioned um, in a previous question about bicarbonate, so that the chemical formula is HCO3 minus, meaning it has extra hydrogen and oxygen. Um, so it's CO2 with an extra hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, that is the form primarily that carbon is stored in the ocean, or it's in a dissolved form. Um, and that's the form that a lot of organisms do capture. So um, the chemistry is slightly different um, than for land plants. Um, are people working on this though? Oh yeah, so when we study um, photosynthetic organisms that live in the ocean, mm -hmm. um, such as uh, cyanobacteria and algae um, that are living in, in the ocean or in freshwater, um, we're studying their mechanisms for how they capture carbon. And, and so that is in the form of capturing carbon from a uh, liquid, so um, from water rather than from air. Great, thank you, Julia. And April, like, um, you know, other kind of, besides prosthetics, people are curious also about um, Alzheimer's. So we have a, just this recent question about Alzheimer's 
as it relates to is is this what you're talking about when they use um, photo biomodulation using infrared light um, and then somebody else and, and you did mention Alzheimer's um, during your presentation so I wonder if that if you could say more about how this um, technology is being used there. Yeah, sure. That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, so recently, uh, this idea of being able to use light to activate cells was used uh, on Alzheimer's patients. And this was using a type of light that's called near infrared light. And the question here is, does the light source or the type of matter of light uh, matter as far as the different effects it has on the neurons or central nervous system? Um, so neurons naturally just on their own actually don't respond to light at all. Like if you just shined a flashlight on a neuron, it wouldn't do anything. Um, and we essentially have to introduce new genetic constructs into these neurons in order to make them respond to light. Um, so going back to the example I gave in my presentation of the mouse that drink water in response to the light to its brain, um, those cells were becoming active because they were specifically engineered to do that. So similarly in the Alzheimer's uh, study that you brought up, those cells that they were targeting were genetically engineered to respond to that specific wavelength of light. Um, so yeah, for that particular study, it, it, it is uh, very specific, it very specifically has to be that type of light that is used to stimulate the cells. But you know, it really just depends on what exactly has been done to the cells to make them, basically what kind of light are they designed to respond to. Great, thank you. And thank you for that question. Those two questions um, folks were asking. Well, hi, uh, can, I, can I clarify that point a bit? This is Jayanti. Yeah, can go for it. <laughs> so the, the reason I'm asking mm -hmm. is, um, there is something about the circadian rhythm. So people say when uh, Alzheimer's patients are, you know, patients who have trouble sleeping, they, if they try to keep the same uh, wake up time and uh, sleep time every day, um, meaning exposure of sunlight is um, pretty much the same every day, or even if they try to uh, sit in a room with bright light for a certain number of hours a day, it seems to help them with uh, their dementia, their cognitive function. So I came from that standpoint. And from your presentation, I thought that the external stimuli of light does help the neurons to react, to respond to external light. So can you expand right. on that? Okay, yeah, I understand. Um, no, you bring up a good point. Um, so keeping a, uh, having your things that you're talking about, like having a regular wake time and sleep time uh, and exposing yourself to light during the day, uh, right. those are all really important to having a normal circadian rhythm. Yeah, like you said, which is really important to brain health in general, including um, if Alzheimer's uh, is an issue. Uh, and that actually works through a different mechanism by what I'm talking about. So your circadian rhythm is largely regulated by light coming in through your eyes. Um, so through a natural process, light comes in through your eyes. Yeah, and okay. this regulates a lot of activity in your brain that's relevant to memory and learning and things like that. Um, what I'm talking about with this optogenetic technology is... Uh, and the microscope technology and uh, when we make the cells fluoresce, we are shining a special type of light, not into the eyes, but directly onto the into cells the brain. in the okay, brain I using a specialized, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a different okay. mechanism by which these cells are being engineered to respond to light. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think now it makes sense because the circadian rhythm is basically, like when you, when you work or stare at the computer for long hours, your eyes getting tired and because of that lack of sleep, that's a totally different mechanism, right? Um, so totally, what? yeah, and, and that's, it. yeah, that is the reason <laughs> that why staring at a computer for so long is really bad for your brain. So yeah, yeah that's correct. <laughs> That's a good distinction yeah. to make though. So thank you for asking that question. Um, Cause even I was like, oh, that's true. Oh wait, yeah, the eyes are the, that's the organ that's <laughs> allowing. There's something in between the, the brain and the light there. So thank you um, for that question. 
Um, just I'll ask you one more question, April, then we'll move over to Julia. Um, and, and if you guys saw something in the chat that you want to address, I'm trying to pull out questions that because people are also just answering each other's questions, which is lovely. I love that you guys are active today. Um, so if you saw something that you found that was interesting that we didn't ask, then feel free to bring it up. But the question for you, um, April, that I'm going to that I pulled out from earlier, which does fear um, or anxiety affect your brain function, affect neurons, um, those sorts of things? Uh, yeah, it really profoundly does. Um, so anxiety itself as a clinical condition has a really strong um, basis in the brain. And there's this interesting feedback loop kind of between um, your brain and, and the rest of your body here. So I'm sure, you know, when you get anxious, when you're um, about to give a presentation or something, you can feel, you know, you can really feel it in your body and you start sweating and your mouth gets dry. And those are all symptoms of stress and anxiety. Um, and some people experience that chronically and that's um, its own thing. But uh, th there's a feedback loop where your brain gains more characteristics of an anxious brain pretty much with certain cells that are overactive or underactive because it feels this response from your body and your, uh, these res this response in your body is perpetuated by uh, certain effects of stress and anxiety in your brain. And over the long term, chronic stress and anxiety can actually contribute significantly to chronic, chronic, uh, sorry, um, cognitive decline and neurodegenerative disease because it's really damaging over time. All right. Well, this is a good time to end your question so you can be less stressed out, <laughs> less anxiety. We're almost done. So did you see anything in the chat that you wanted to just bring up one last time? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I can't find it now, but I saw someone was asking about if organoids can respond to stimuli. Mm -hmm. um, so just really quickly, organi organoids are this interesting thing that I actually didn't touch on at all. So it's, it's cool that you brought that up where we can grow um, sort of miniature brains in a dish and then, oh, thank you. Uh, and then see how that responds to uh, various conditions and things like that. And the issue, the organoids are great and are useful for a lot of experimental questions, but the issue specifically with getting them to respond to stimuli the same way neurons in an animal would um, is that, for example, we can show a, uh, some kind of visual stimulus to a mouse and then see how cells in its brain respond. But if these are just neurons in a dish, essentially, there isn't an eye there to receive the stimuli. So theoretically, the organoid neurons just sitting in a dish would be able to respond to stimuli, but there isn't an eye there to deliver that information to them, if that makes sense. That was great. Thank you so much, April. I'm glad that we got you back. No more technical difficulties, because these are great <laughs> questions. All right, and last one for Julia um, before we sign off, unless again, you saw something in the chat you wanna address. Um, but is modifying crops to collect CO2 more um, efficient, is it a more efficiently a viable option for the world at large? Really essentially thinking about scaling up, right? Would there be an effect on nutritional value of these crops? Um, is this something that we can realistically do? Um, sort of this original question with solar power, for example, right? Originally it was thought, well, we can't do this on a large enough scale. Now we can. So how, how do you feel about doing this at, at large scales? Uh, so this is a nice question. And um, the technology is still pretty young. Um, so. The, we're still learning about these ways to make uh, photosynthetic, to take what we know about how to make photosynthesis and carbon capture in plants more efficient, and then actually engineering the plants to be more efficient. So as of right now, um, it doesn't exist yet. We haven't been able to transfer over um, like the cyanobacterial carboxysome or the algal pyrenoid, um, these specialized structures to capture CO2, we haven't yet been able to put those into plants and see that plants grow bigger. Um, so it's a technology that's on the horizon and why people like me study this stuff. Um, but there, there 
lots of other things to consider when thinking about, you know, feeding the billions more mouths that we'll have in coming decades, um, such as engineering plants to be more drought tolerant um, and other ways uh, improving the soil communities to increase plant health, um, lots and lots of other ways to address these questions about how we're gonna feed the world. Um, so this is just one little nugget that uh, I study and I wanted to share. Love that. Um, did you see anything that we missed? I think, yeah, we, we pretty much got it all. Um, well, I'm going to thank you all and welcome you back next week, next month. Um, we have so many more programs for you and I hope to see you soon. And I especially hope to see you soon when we are back in our communities and on campus and welcoming you and we can hug and, and just be normal at least a little bit again. Um, so again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for those of you who donated. And thank you, of course, and especially to our two fabulous presenters who have such a bright future ahead of them and so much more to learn and to do in this world. So thank you again and everyone have a wonderful evening. We'll see you soon.